So real quickly, what I want to do is just give you a quick review of angels and demons in the Old Testament. So you may remember that when we tend to think about angels, we tend to think of these heavenly beings, these men with swords and, and with uh, wings and often colored or, or, or like multicolors, and, and we, or we think of angels sitting on a cloud playing a harp. But when angels show up in the earthly realm, they don't have wings, right? Uh, in the heavenly realm, they do, but the angels that interact with people do not. The messengers that interact, they, they appear as people when they appear. The closest we get is probably is the cherubim that is set at the garden, right? And so maybe you could say that that's kind of a cherubim like we read about in Ezekiel and in Revelation, and maybe it had, had wings, but that's almost like a different creature. There's kind of almost different species of angels, right? Like we see these guardian angels that are around the throne versus these messenger angels that, that show up on earth. And, and, and a clear one, as we talked about, the one that showed up, you may remember the three that showed up to Abraham and Sarah, right? Just as a quick one to announce that Sarah would uh, give birth to a son. And then two of them go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that? And announce and bring destruction upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But when we think about angels and basically these spiritual beings, we need to think more instead of just kind of this army and, and these different beings. We need to think of the divine council, right? All of these beings that surround God in heaven. So if you will, look, Micaiah, this is 1 Kings 22, 19 through 20. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitude of heaven. All the multitude of heaven surrounded God. So when we think about angels and divine beings, we need to think about all the multitudes that are surrounding God. And we notice sometimes, right, they, they show up here maybe in the form, in fleshly form. It's often they look like a person or in 1 Kings, it's a spirit that came forward even in the heavenly realm and said, I will entice them, right? So, but when we think of, of God and these heavenly things, we think about the counsel of God. If you will, all right, go to the next slide, Eric. And then we have two more passages in Psalm 80, uh, 82, 1 and 6. God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods, that's really confusing to us at first because we believe in one God. We don't believe in multiple gods like these other religions do. But then in Psalm 82, verse 6, you have, a same, you have a similar thing. You are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. So in the lowercase gods, and we see that through the Old Testament, they use the word Elohim, which singular often refers to God, the Most High God. But when it's plural and it's plural for, for, form, and that's kind of confusing, it refers to these divine beings. And, and we get confused by this word God. We need to understand that in the Old Testament, they're not saying they do not rival the true God, okay? So when we see that lowercase God, they do not rival the true God. But when we see gods in heavenly council, it means angels, anything in God's spiritual realm, right? It's not the true God, but when we see that word show up, we, we can think about angels. They fit into that, right? They're not, uh, they are eternal and they are divine and that they're part of the heavenly realm, but they are not the all-powerful God. Well, let me say they are mortal. They're not eternal. Y'all get the difference between those two terms, right? They're immortal in that they don't die, but they're not eternal in that they've always existed. God created them, right? So uh, next, if you will, go to the next slide. Then we have in Psalm 89, 5 through 7, again, the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For in the skies above can compare with the Lord who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings. Again, God is among these heavenly beings. And when we see the word, the small g God, we need to think about heavenly beings. They're not rivals to God. But they're heavenly beings. They're part of God's divine counsel. We read about it. It surrounds his throne in Revelation. And in heaven here, God is surrounded by heavenly beings, the counsel of the holy ones. 
So real quick, to go a little bit further, the divine council, as we understand it, anybody got any questions? Because I know we're going way back to a few months ago. Does that part make sense to everybody so far? Are we tracking pretty good? Okay. So the divine council, when we understand uh, angels, and when I say angels, I like to think the divine council, the people that are still in good with God, versus demons. The angels are the ones that stayed loyal to God. The demons, right, the fallen angels are members of the divine council that rebelled against, uh, against God. Does anybody know, remember where we read about that? About that rebellion? It's a verse that we skip over a lot, right? So sometimes we've observed the Passover on these verses that we don't understand. Does anybody remember where that shows up? Genesis chapter 6, right? The sons of God see the daughters of, man, of men and they look down and they see that they're beautiful and they come in and they intermarry with them. And what happened there was so evil to God, this crossing over of the divine into the earthly realm and having children in the earthly realm that God destroyed the world with the flood, right? That leads directly up to that. And so from that point on, we have, and we're going to talk a little bit more about these that have fallen. We've got the divine council, the ones that have stayed loyal to God. We've got the ones that rebelled against God in Genesis chapter 6 and who God, it was so evil what they did, it led directly to the flood. So when we talk about the fall, we think of Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve. And what we're going to talk about tonight is in the intertestamental literature, right? And we're going to talk about that in just a second. They actually thought of it in three falls. There was the first fall, Adam and Eve right? First time sin came in the world and broke up God's perfect relationship with people. They also have a second, they talked about a second fall, which was when these divine um, beings from heaven looked down and crossed that boundary, right? And they actually put more emphasis on that than they do on Adam and Eve. Anybody know how often Adam and Eve show up after Genesis chapter 4? They don't show up a single time in the Old Testament after that. And then they show up just a few times in, in the New Testament. They show up, let's see, actually I don't have those slides on here. Um, but Eve only shows up twice after that. She shows up in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Uh, but she says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray. And then she shows up again. In 1 Timothy 2.13, for Adam was formed first in Eve. Those are the only two other times. As much emphasis as we put on that on Adam and Eve, those are the only two times in the whole Bible other than Genesis chapter 1 through 4 uh, that, that she shows up. Um, and then Adam, if you take out genealogies, doesn't show up much more than that. Adam shows up again. And interestingly, Y'all know that whole head covering passage in, in 1 Corinthians 11 that just confuses all of us? You know what I'm talking about? Tells women to, to cover their head and, and the woman's hair is her glory, all that stuff. That actually this understanding, and we won't talk about, this is just a teaser. <laughs> We're not going to talk about this this week. But the understanding of uh, this second fall and the, the, the watchers and, and things that we've talked about, these... Uh, rebellious sons of God that looked down from heaven and uh, 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 saw the, the, the daughters of men, right, and had children and, and had children with them, that actually, when we understand that, it makes sense of 1 Corinthians 11, but we're going to talk about that at a later date. But with Adam, you've got, he shows up in Romans 5, 14, um, that nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, right? And then we learn later that Jesus is the second Adam. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam, all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 45, the first man, Adam, being a living being, the last Adam, talking about Jesus, a life-giving spirit. And then we have the passage in 1 Timothy 2, where uh, Eve showed up. And then in 1 Timothy 2, 14, the next verse, 
Adam shows up again. Those are the only times they show up. Adam shows up one more time in Jude 14. And it's going to be interesting. This is going to come back around. Jude 14 says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. This is a direct quote from the book of Enoch, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So all of this emphasis we put on Adam and Eve in the fall, the Bible really doesn't talk very much about after the fall. We talk a lot more about it than the Bible does. But this second Genesis 6 understanding really influences the way that Jesus and his apostles understood the spirit world. I'm going to give you a few examples of that tonight. Um, the, other, the other fall is First Corinthians, or not First Corinthians, Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. God spread out all the people, and we're going to talk about this. After they rebelled against God, you may remember this story. God confused their language and spread them out. And then you've got a table of nations. We're going to show later how these sons of God uh, were put in charge of these different nations. And it says it right in the text. If this sounds crazy, which it may very well, I'm going to show you right where it says that in the Bible <laughs> that we've just read right over for all of these years. And so all of these beings were put in, put in charge of these different spaces. And so what they would call the second fall, which we don't read a lot about in the Bible, but it shows up in the intertestamental literature, which we're going to talk about, uh, is when these foreign gods rebelled against God. And so when we think foreign gods, we want to think about Baal. We want to think about Asherah. We want to think about Dagon, right? You may remember some of these gods from the, the Old Testament. We tend to think of them as just idols. But in the Old Testament worldview, uh, they actually thought they were real beings that had rebelled against God and had real power. When they went up and they had that contest with Elijah on Mount Carmel, you may remember that story, and they cried out. It was a contest with God. It wasn't that they didn't think that Baal had no power. They thought Baal had no power. What God showed is that Baal had no power in the presence of God. Now, we don't have to believe that, that Baal was an actual being, an entity, but what we'll show through this class is it's hard to believe that they didn't think that Baal had real power, right? Just like they also thought that demons had real power. We know about that with Jesus, right? He cast demons out. If they weren't real, he wouldn't have been able to do that, right? So they actually, it doesn't mean we have to necessarily uh, believe that Baal was, a, is, was or is a real being, even though I can make an argument that we do, but we, I don't know that we have to. But it's hard to deny that they did. And you may even remember that we talked about this last time too. Um, what We think of the word Satan to describe the devil. What's another word in the New Testament that we use to, de to describe the devil? Say so what? Liar, that's one. But think of a long name, right? Jesus says, the prince of demons, you say I cast out names. Uh, you, they claim that Jesus cast out demons by whose name? Does anybody remember? Beelzebub, that's right, Beelzebub. What does Beel sound like? Baal, that's right. And the Zebub is the Aramaic for prince. Prince Baal, right? That's, that's so clear in the Hebrew. And so you got to think they're speaking Aramaic and they're translating this term Beelzebub, Prince Baal. Rick? Oh, get the microphone. Hand in the microphone. <laughs> All right, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Okay. And in the Old Testament, we had God, capital G, yep. was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in one. Yes. After the resurrection, we had the Son that sits by God. Yeah, actually, it, by God, it, yeah. So there's actually two at that point. Yes, yeah. Well, what technically what we would say is that the Father, Son, and the Spirit have always existed, right? And we see the Spirit clearly in the Old Testament. We see it in Genesis 1, and the Spirit hovered among the waters, 
right? We see it show up in other places. The Spirit of God came on King David. You may remember that. The Spirit of God, uh, when, when a king received the anointing, what that anointing meant was the presence, the Spirit of God. Um, and what Jesus was, was the eternal Son of God made flesh, right? So this gets technical, and this gets a little bit out of our out of our lane a little bit, but when we think of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they existed eternally. And actually what even, and I, I remember, I think it was Amy that said this, this blew her mind last time. Uh, in, in ancient uh, Judaism, up until, say, uh, after, after Christians, uh, Christianity actually became a rival for Judaism, the rabbis had a two Yahweh um, belief that the same Yahweh, I mean, they didn't think he was two different gods, but they thought there was Yahweh that was spirit that never showed up physically. But then Yahweh, when Yahweh showed up in the physical realm, it represented a, a different God. So think about the burning bush, right? When God showed up in the burning bush and think about when God revealed his name, right? In the burning bush, what did he say? I am, right? I am, Yahweh, the, 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 the I am. Think about what Jesus, how, how Jesus answered the Pharisees, right? I am, right? He answered in the same phrase that God who showed up physically on earth answered. He was pointing himself back there, right? So when God comes and fully lives as a human, we see what it talks about in Colossians, that Jesus is the visible form of the invisible God, right? So when God shows up in flesh, it represents this other part of the Trinity. But that's another lesson. That's actually a whole other class. So we're going to, uh, but does that help a little bit, Rick? Okay. All right. So kind of kind of going back to that, right? The other thing, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, and we're going to come back to this later as well. So we got evil spirits. They're the ones that rebelled against God. But also these Nephilim, you remember that that's what the children of the sons of God and the daughters of men had. They were called Nephilim, and they show up two times. Uh, they show up in, in Genesis chapter 6, and they show up again in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, I think. I thought I had that here, but I do not. Uh, but anyway, they show up two times. And so what happened was these sons, this is what they believed in intertestamental literature, that these sons that were born, now I know this gets a little bit confusing, but I'm going to try to make it, bring it all together toward the end, that the offspring, these half God, half people that were born when the sons of God in Genesis 6, that what, the, what they believed was that these spirits, since they weren't fully human, could not go to the place, the Hadean realm, what they believed in the Old Testament, where human spirits went. But they also couldn't ascend back to heaven. So they were stuck here on earth. So when you read evil spirits in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, what they would say is that you've got this finite number of spirits that were the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood, and uh, uh, the spirits that are caught here on earth, right, cannot exist. They can't be reborn, but they can't die because they're in the middle. I know this sounds crazy, so you guys, before y'all think that I'm crazy and y'all ship me out of here, just hear me out. We're going to kind of get back around. I'm going to show you how this makes sense when we read certain New Testament passages. But they were kind of these half God, half men. And once their bodies died, their spirits couldn't go to heaven to be back with those spirits. But they weren't people, so they couldn't go where spirits, where people spirits went either. So they were stuck in between. And I'm going to read a couple passages at the end to make that make sense. All right. So now that I've got you thoroughly confused, let's go to the, uh, we're going to talk about the intertestamental literature. So Eric, if you will go, um, this is the Apocrypha. And it shows up in Roman Catholics have it in their Bible. The Greek Orthodox have it in their Bible. The Russian Orthodox have it in their Bible. And uh, the Coptic Orthodox churches, which think Egyptian, have it in their Bible. 
So these are the books, the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha are the books that were written between the completion of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, this is what's really important. This is not scripture, okay? We don't view it as scripture. It's not scripture. Yet, New Testament writers sought some of these books. Can anybody think of a Jewish holiday that was celebrated in the time of Jesus that does not show up in the Old Testament? We know it now. It's probably the most famous. When we think of Jews today, the Jewish people and the holidays that they celebrate, this is the one that we would probably think of first. Well, Passover, but we got Passover in the Old Testament, right? What's the next one? What's the next one you think of that we can't think about in our Bible, but they celebrate along the same time we celebrate one of our big holidays? Say what? Hanukkah. That's right, Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the festival of lights. This shows up in, Ma in, the, in the Maccabees, right? The Maccabees are hiding. They're, they're in this fight with the Greeks. They're trying to retake Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been... Uh, captured by, I think it was the Seleucids, right? So they've captured it, and you've got the Maccabean Revolt. And so they've risen up, and they're trying to take it back over, and they're having to hide from these Greek Macedonian soldiers in these caves. And everybody remember what a menorah looks like? I should have put a picture of a menorah up here, but I didn't. Uh, it's got eight places, you know, eight candlestick holders. You remember that. Um, and actually, the menorah... That's the same shaped candle that was put in the Ark of the Covenant and later put on in the temple too, right? It's the same shape. That, that same shape was in the, the Ark of the Covenant and in the temple. But what happened was they're stuck in these caves for eight days. I think it's eight days. I'm going off the top of my head. I don't know my Hanukkah history very well or my intertestamental. But guess what happened? Miraculously, they kept getting oil so that they could keep their lights lit. And so that's where we get the celebration of Hanukkah that Jews celebrate today. You know uh, that Hanukkah never shows up in the Old Testament, shows up in the Apocrypha. Guess where else it shows up? Shows up in the New Testament. John chapter 22, if you will go to the next slide, Eric. 1022, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. The festival of dedication is Hanukkah, right? So, and, and some of our translations, if you've got a King James, it may say the festival of lights in the King James. It may not, but, but some of our translations actually translate it, the festival of lights in John 10, 22. So we don't have Hanukkah in the Old Testament. Uh, it shows up, it's a celebration of, of what happened in the Maccabean revolt. And yet in the New Testament, it shows that it had a big enough influence that the Jews were celebrating this. Uh, in John 10, 22, and Jesus celebrated Hanukkah too. I just think that's so cool, right? So what, what these intertestamental, what these scriptures do, they're not scripture, but they tell us about the world that Jesus lived in, right? This is called Second Temple. So from 519, after you may remember from Ezra and Nehemiah, that uh, they came back and they rebuilt Jerusalem. They rebuilt the wall and they rebuilt the temple until AD 70, after the Romans, around Revelation, we were, maybe you guys remember this, the Romans uh, sacked and they destroyed the temple in AD 70. Between that is called Second Temple Period, right? Because you got the first temple that was destroyed by the Assyrians, no, by the Babylonians, destroyed by the Babylonians. And then when the Jews came back, they rebuilt it. So the Second Temple stood until AD 70. And now, those of you who know about Jerusalem know that there's no temple in Jerusalem. After the Romans destroyed it, all that we have is a temple mount. So what is the point of understanding and knowing about these different books? We're going to look primarily at the book of Enoch. And Enoch actually is not even in the Apocrypha. It's in what's called the pseudepigrapha. Didn't even make it into the Apocrypha. It's not even in the Catholic, the Orthodox, the Coptic. It's not in any of their Bibles. So why would we look at Enoch? Now, what I will say is that some of those passages are Scripture. Some of those intertestamental passages are Scripture. Does anybody know why? Say what, Miss Gail? Is... 
okay? That there is some Old Testament quotations, but also they were quoted in the New Testament. And when they're quoted in the New Testament, they become our scripture, right? So Enoch, not the whole book of Enoch, just what was quoted. Uh, in, if you will, bring up the next slide, Eric. 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6 are direct quotations from the book of Enoch. For if God did not spare angels, remember what we talked about, angels sin in Genesis chapter 6. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. And then Jude chapter 6, or Jude verse 6, there's only one chapter. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Direct quotations from the book of Enoch. Now, does that mean all of Enoch is scripture? No, it doesn't. But this is scripture, right? We all agree with that, don't we? And it means that at the very least, they read it and they knew it and it influenced how they thought. So what these books in the middle, they help us do, and I, and I want you to understand how important I think this is. I don't think they were scripture. Yet, they tell us what they were thinking in the time of Jesus because Jesus lived in that second temple period, right? They tell us what Jesus thought, what the Jews around Jesus were thinking. Even if Jesus himself wasn't thinking it, the, 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 the Jews around him were thinking it. And we know that these scriptures were important enough that New Testament writers quoted them from time to time. So that's pretty important, right? So Enoch more than any other book helps us understand. It shows us what they thought about Genesis chapter six. So if you will, Eric, pull that slide up. And I want to go through three things real quick. And then after I go through these, these three kind of explaining the worldview, next week we're going to come back and show how uh, these, uh, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, for these intertestamental books, they actually expound on this. And then the way they expound all of a sudden helps us understand the way that uh, especially the demons and unclean spirits were functioning in the New Testament. And I'm going to show you one example at the end of this that I think is going to blow your mind. It blew my mind when I saw it. Maybe it'll blow your mind too. And it's just scripture. That's the thing that's so crazy. Like this feels so far out, but it's just scripture. And, and, it, and it helps us kind of give us a key. So 6, 1 through 4. When the human beings began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. Their days will be 120. The Nephilim, right? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, and we're going to show how they were on the earth afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. We don't know a lot about that, but Enoch and these books in, in, in the intertestamental period say a lot about it. It's not scripture, but then when we understand that and we look at what Enoch says and then we read the New Testament, we can see that they influenced the way that they understood uh, what happened in Genesis chapter six. All right, go to the next slide. Uh, Genesis 11, 7 through 9, right? God confused their language. I'm not going to read all them. Scattered them from all, uh, over all the earth. And then the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. After this, God gives a table of nations. You may remember this, where all the different nations that, that God scattered them. And I'll give you a little preview. Uh, if you look at Paul's missionary journey, he covers the same territory that's covered in the table of nations in Genesis chapter 11, which goes all the way. Remember where Paul, uh, uh, Paul was headed to, um, uh, not Tarsus, uh, anyway, Spain, right? In the Roman Empire, that is actually the furthest reach of the table of nations in Genesis chapter 11. So Paul actually goes to all of these nations that God identifies later in Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on too. All right, next, next slide. Deuteronomy 32, eight through nine. This is so important. This tells us so much. When the most high gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, look at this. He fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Remember that thing I said earlier that sounded so crazy that these other God, the, these other divine council members were, 
uh, were put over authority of the different nations. Well, here it is right here plainly in, in Deuteronomy chapter 32. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. That's what it says in your King James and your ESV, I think. The NIV, this is so confusing to writers for a long time. They didn't even translate it the right way. They said sons of Israel, even though sons of Israel doesn't even show up in this text, right? The, the Hebrew says sons of God. So here it is, that crazy thing that I said, it's right here. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So all of these other nations belong to these sons of God. But Jacob belongs to the true God. Next, next passage. Deuteronomy, this is where it gets crazy again. This is the flip side of the coin. And beware lest you raise your eyes to the heaven. And when you look and see the sun, moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven... Look at this, and remember, host of heaven, host of heaven, divine counsel, right? All, all of the hosts, when they saw that, they thought sons of God. And right here, we see this rebellion. Uh, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples, right, under the whole heaven. So all the peoples, but not them. He's allotted them to them, right? He is their God, not these other hosts. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance, as you are this day. So, remember, if you will go to Genesis 6-4 and Numbers 13, this last one. Okay, remember, I've quoted this in Genesis 6-4, and here we are in Numbers 13-33. The Nephilim... Right, we're on the earth in those days, and we thought everybody got wiped out by the flood. Remember, except for, um, except for uh, Adam, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives and their families. Right, and but here in Numbers thirteen, here we got the Nephilim again. The descendants, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. You know who else comes from the Nephilim? The Canaanites. Right? These are the same people, the conquest. When, it, when, when, the, when Israelites conquest, they're not just defeating all of these other humans. These people, they, remember they talk about how tall they are, how they're like grasshoppers next to them. Remember the Nephilim are the heroes of old. If you trace it back, what you see is they are the descendants of the Nephilim. All right? So God is not out there destroying people, just regular old people. It is these people that represent these rebellious sons of God that had these half God, half people, and when their spirits die, they can't descend in to the Hadean realm where in the Old Testament they understood people to go, and they can't go back to the spirit world, so they're stuck here in this in-between. Rick, I saw your hand raised. Yeah. Like six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand years. Yeah. They took into the sun. Yeah. Well, that was before. It's actually after Noah, if you remember this, that God put the limit on how long people could live. So they lived so long, and they got more and more evil to the point where the Nephilim actually, or not the Nephilim, but the sons of God. Remember they broached that and they came down and they had children with the daughters of men and that was so bad that God said I'm putting a limit on how long people can live right um, so now that I've got you thoroughly confused and we're here at the end remember what I said I think maybe the craziest thing that I may have said in this whole uh, that to me when I first read it if I'm being completely honest was the hardest for me to grasp was this idea of the Nephilim that were killed in the flood and then um, the Canaanites that were killed in the conquest being these kind of spirits with no place to go. They roam the earth, right? I want to read this passage to you. Remember, they can't go. Uh, they can't go in the Hadean realm. They can't go to heaven. Anybody remember the story of the man in the tombs? The Gesinerat, anybody remember that? 
He was so strong. He was demon possessed. They would put chains on him. He would break them at night. He would run naked through the tombs and scare people off. You remember that story? Jesus came up on him and he recognized, they recognized Jesus, which to me is an indicator that they've been around for a while, right? They recognize Jesus and they say, son of man, don't cast us out of here. And then they beg him to what? Am I remember? Cast him, cast him into a herd of pigs. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake were drowned. Now, what do we notice when these unclean spirits show up in the New Testament? They torment people, right? You've got the son that, that, uh, the, um, that is rolling around and throwing himself into the fire. You've got one demon uh, that's kind of following uh, that can actually uh, uh, predict the future. I can't remember who she's following uh, uh, with Paul, but remember Paul cast that demon out and they get, so, they get really angry at Paul because he, he cast that demon out. We've got all of these other instances where Jesus shows up and he starts casting demons out. What I want to suggest is that this is Jesus showing that he has power in the spirit realm, that he's got power over these unclean spirits. And when Jesus shows up and he starts casting them out, it's not just about helping people. It's to show his authority. Let me give you another passage, if you will go to the last one here, Eric, that I think all of a sudden this passage makes a little bit more sense when we see it this way. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. This is the demon you remember is talking about Jesus talking about a person that has a demon cast out of him and he roams around the desert, the arid regions. And let me tell you something else. When they talked about the desert, you remember when Jesus went to the desert, uh, uh, you remember he was tormented by wild animals and evil spirits. They thought that the desert region was where these evil spirits resided. So he goes out into these arid regions, these de desert regions, and circles around, can't find anywhere to stay, comes back, finds this person's house, swept clean. Then it goes, takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. So if we can imagine these are the spirits, they, they, they cannot be reborn, right? There's no more God. Uh, these gods are not coming down anymore and falling again and falling in love with the daughters of men. But you've got these spirits that are stuck. The only way, what they do is they have to torment something else and so you see it right here jesus talks about how they go in these arid regions they can't find anybody else so they have to find something else to torment when jesus shows up and he shows power over the unclean spirits he is reversing what has happened in the flood he is reversing the second fall and he is reversing uh, when Jesus, when all of the nations are called back under the authority of God, that is Jesus, that is God saying, no longer are these nations under the authority of Baal, are they under the authority of Asherah, are they under the authority, all of the nations now belong to me. So I want to look back and read, if you will, go back to the first slide that I had, and then we'll end right here. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18. Look through here. Uh, when we get down to, let's see, the power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. When we read powers and principalities in the New Testament, they are very often talking about the spirit realm. And they're very often talking about, and we read about this in Daniel too. We catch glimpses of this in Daniel and really all through the Bible. But we read about how Jesus has dethroned the authorities, 
right? He has his foot on their neck. You may remember that, that they are his footstool. That is not just Jesus being in power. That is God dethroning all of these other powers that have rebelled against him. Um, and so now Jesus is far above all of those authorities, powers, and dominions, not only in this present age, but in the age to come. Look at this. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything, which is the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So right here, and we're, this is where we're going to come back next week. So uh, we're going to really get down into what it says in those. I'm going to explain a little bit more about what happens in the intertestamental literature and show exactly where that shows up in the New Testament and show exactly how all of a sudden a lot of these passages that didn't make any sense, they make sense. You know that passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 where Jesus goes down and preaches to the spirits in prison? Y'all remember that passage? Hard to make sense of that. Remember it talks about after Noah uh, that people that you know, it compares baptism to the ark. And just as Noah, all of humanity was saved through water, so we're saved through baptism. That's a good Church of Christ verse. We usually remember those when they talk about baptism, right? Right after that, it says that Jesus, uh, when he was in the tomb, went in uh, and preached to the spirits that were stuck in prison. That makes sense when we read Enoch. All of a sudden, Enoch tells this story about the sons of God that rebelled against God being put into prison. And remember, 2 Peter quotes Enoch directly, as does Jude. So even though Enoch is not scripture, it can help us understand, as some, several of those other texts can, what was going on in the world of Jesus. All right. We're done. Anybody got any questions before we finish up? How do y'all feel? Is your, is your, are you okay? Are you tracking with me? Is your brain scrambled? Where, where are you at? Scrambled? Uh-oh. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Okay. Okay. Well, look, let me pray with y'all and then we'll be, Eric, do we have any questions up there? Okay. All right. Let me pray with you guys and we'll be dismissed. Creator God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. Just be with us and bless us and help us to learn a little bit more about you every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, real quick before you go, um, next week, this stuff, we're, we're going to really lean into that and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. Then we're going to go through, spend a couple weeks in the New Testament, and then we're going to start answering these questions that we all have about angels and demons right about how they exist after we've got this foundation set. So you're dismissed.